Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would allow me to decrease, that your presence here would increase, that you would apply your word and the truth of it to our lives. Help us to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we're going to be speaking about the topic of judging others. Woohoo! I know it's a, it's a judgment is always an exciting topic in the Word of God, unless you have something to hide. No, we're going to be looking at a scripture in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Judge not that you not be judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So I'd like, to, I'd like us to look at some facts about judgment and judging. First and foremost, judgment is reserved for God to execute and also for him to appoint others to exercise judgment. We see an example of God judging Pharaoh in the Old Testament in, ex in Exodus 12 verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So it's pretty clear here that judgment is solely in the camp of God, that we shouldn't even be touching it unless we, we confer with the one who is the judge. Now we also see that David acknowledges that God's judgments are true as well. David has just had an affair with Bathsheba and he has been convicted of his sin. In Psalm 51, four, we read, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So we see that God has not only, he, he not only executes judgment as we saw with the Jews when they were in captivity under Pharaoh in Egypt, God sent that final judgment against them and killed the firstborn. In fact, that's where we get Passover from because the angel of death passed over. And now we see that, um, that the mighty man David even acknowledges that God is the one who who is justified in passing his judgments against us. Furthermore, in Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 12, verse 14, we read, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So God is the only one that can see the secret things that we do. Everything, every aspect, every part of our life will be laid open for judgment. Those things that we think that we do in secret and in private where no one knows about it god is aware of those things we will be judged by god when we try to judge another we will be judged for the fact that we are judging and in the way that we seek to judge others as we read in matthew chapter 6 judge not or matthew chapter 7 verse 1 judge not that you not be judged he says if you don't want to be judged then don't judge another person. He says, because when you do judge another person, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. So for the fact that we judge another person and in the way that we judge another person, we are going to receive judgment. And this is because when we seek to judge another person, we are usurping God's power. We are putting ourselves in the place of God. It would almost be like someone that dressed up like a cop and they took their car and you can buy these used cop cars and sometimes you see people they try to and i know that that when i used to drive on the on the highway and i would see somebody come up and you see that little spotlight below the uh the driver's side 
mirror and you're like, oh man, I think that's an under undercover cop and then they pass you and it turns out that it's just some old cop car, you know, that maybe somebody bought in an auction. You're like, oh man, I slowed down for nothing <laughs> or maybe I should be more accountable in how I drive. But regardless of that, I actually saw um, a guy on YouTube who was, uh, he, had t he, he was pretending to be an undercover cop and he pulled over another car. Well, the car that he pulled over actually happened to be an undercover cop and the guy got arrested for impersonating a police officer, which is something that we ought not to do, whether on the level of authority of a mere cop or at the level of authority of God. You see, we are not equipped to judge. We, when we try to judge, our motivations are always evil. Unless God has specifically appointed us to exercise judgment, our judgment is going to be flawed. We are not equipped to judge. And God says, if you seek to judge when you are ill-equipped to judge, greater judgment will be passed upon you because you are basically blind by this log of sin that's in your own eye. And yet you seek, as it says in, it says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? He, he acknowledges the fact that they're evil. He calls them a hypocrite. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We would never go on a jungle safari with a blind tour guide. He may tell us, go ahead and grab that vine there and it would be a poisonous snake. No, we would only want to follow someone that has the ability to truly see. And God says, when you try to judge another person, you are not even dealing with your own sin in your sinfulness first. Um, and in the way that we judge another person, we're going to be judged in that same way. We, our motivation to judge another person might be because we want to put that person down or we want to, or maybe we're trying to build ourselves up by virtue of the fact that we're saying, oh, we're gonna call somebody out on their sin and we're gonna say, I don't sin in that same way. We're denying mercy to that person when we judge. And when we deny mercy to them, mercy will be denied to us. Now, there are times that God appoints judges and this is good because this is being God-led. It's being led by the very person who is capable of judging. We see this under the rule of Moses. Moses had just um, led the people out of their captivity in Egypt under Pharaoh. In fact, we see why, because of the firstborn that was killed during Passover. And now he's leading this, this band of Jews out into the wilderness. And uh, after he confers with his father-in-law Jethro, uh, Jethro said, you know what, there's way too many people for you to be handling all of their disputes and being the peacemaker. You need to appoint um, some people that will help you lead. And so basically in, in this way, he helped to kind of establish a form of government within their masses. He, he through, through God's guidance, he appointed judges of tens and um, fives of tens and fifties, basically people that were capable of, of ruling smaller um, groups within their community. He said, let's appoint them. And then when, when trouble arises, when there is need to settle a dispute, they can go to them and then they will help to keep the peace by providing just rule, rules and um, decisions upon matters. And so in this way, these people were appointed as judges. And then of course, we see the book of Judges in the Old Testament, and this was basically between the rule of the prophets and the rule of the kings. These were godly men and women that God appointed in order to lead, to guide, and to be there to provide the governor, governing um, rulership um, for the people at that time. And once again, these were also appointed to exercise judgment by God. Now, a lot of times I think we mistake judgment and discernment. You see, we are called not to judge, but to be discerning. Um, we are to exercise prudence and wisdom with both people 
and the situations of life. In Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 we read, And it is my prayer <clears throat> that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And it's very interesting how he says that in order for love to abound, um, that it would be partnered with knowledge and discernment so that we will be able to rightly uh, look at one thing and look at another thing and tell what truly is excellent because there's a lot of things out there that are going to try to compete for that which is good. And God says that there's some are evil and some are good. Some are going to try to put themselves up there as good when in truth they're actually evil. So that if we will, with knowledge and discernment, um, abounding with love, we will be able to approve what is excellent so that we will be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Jesus gave instructions to his own disciples in how they should be discerning when he sent them out to minister. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 and 14, we read, And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. So this is very interesting. Jesus is basically saying that I've not called you to minister to everyone, but to assess the best use of your time and talents. God says, I want you to be effective, but in order to be effective, you must be discerning. You see, discernment works hand in hand with stewardship. Last week, Mona shared about the talents that uh, this ruler had given to his servants. And one was given five, and one was given 10, and one was given 50. And at the ends of the process, they were judged based upon how they used and utilized their talents. And the one that had the one that hit it, that didn't even put it in the bank to gain interest, was basically judged harshly because he did nothing with it. He was not a good steward with the talent that he had been entrusted. And in the same way, God says, I'm not asking you to waste your time on futile endeavors. I want you to use wisdom and prudence and use the gifts and the abilities and the time and the money that I have entrusted you so that you will be effective in the, in the ministry that I've called you to do. I do want to share one thing about uh, the verse that I read in Matthew 10, 11 through 14. He says, and whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it. When I worked for a company called Faith Comes by Hearing, Hosanna, their, their local uh, Bible, an international Bible distributor here in the, in the Albuquerque area, they um, put out uh, a lot of different digital versions of the, of the Bible in multiple languages. And they work closely with Bible translators. And uh, I had learned that whenever these Bible translators go into a new village um, of a language that is yet to be translated, they will go in and they will seek out the person of influence. Much like uh, Jesus instructed his disciples, he says, find out who is worthy in it. Basically, this person that is worthy is going to have some sort of um, role of influence within that community. And by seeking out this person, they're going to be effective. They're going to be able to effectively move and operate within this town because this person of influence is going to wield a weight of authority and power by which they're going to then be able to influence other people. Last week, when um, Cookie and Phil and Anne and Sean shared about their trip to India. They talked about when this one day when they were on a prayer walk and how they had gone into this one um, 
area and they were actually invited into people's homes. And we heard that from after the fact of that meeting that there were still people that were meeting um, because of the impact that had taken place. So they obviously went to people's houses, people, um, one that were receptive and people that had influence because the um, impact of that little bit of ministry um, grew into a larger um, result. And so that's what God is asking us to do. He's saying, be uh, prayerful, be mindful and discerning of the places that you go. And um, that way your effectiveness will be great. There are other places that we are called to um, pass judgment, but I think uh, a better word would be to evaluate. Sometimes we evaluate qualifications of those serving in godly leadership roles. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and part of 2, it says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. And then it goes on to list a lot of his other qualifications. You see, in this situation, judgment is being passed upon someone that is aspiring to a, a godly office. And all of these judgments, that all of the qualifications of this judgment is found upon God's word. And we're going to see that this is standard throughout all of judgment. When God judges us, he judges us according to his word. When, um, when Moses established the qualifications for those that would lead the fives and the and the tens and the fifties and hundreds, he established them. They had to be men and women um, that qualified according to God's word. And also we see that um, the overseer is one that is voluntarily allowing themselves to be judged. In fact, they're, they're seeking it out. And so both the judge and the judged are in relationship and in agreement about the process of how they're going to be judged. And what's very interesting is that if I bet you, if a person that was aspiring to one of these leadership roles was to fail, they are usually open to learning how they can improve so that they can qualify. This reminds me of stories that my wife shares with me. She uh, is a, a, a supervisor. She's a manager at her work. And uh, many times they'll be hiring to fill a like a lead role that she oversees and she's usually on that panel of people that interview and a lot of times they'll have an internal candidate someone that currently works under her in a lower level like maybe as a clerk and they're they're aspiring to like a lead position and they go and they interview and then at the end one of these people they don't they don't get selected my wife takes the time and she sits down with them and she says well this is something that you could work on for the next time that you interview and don't feel bad that you didn't get it this time because it took me a couple of tries before I was able to to secure a supervisor role as well and so it's with that kind of openness and it's with that kind of partnership that we have this this great relationship that's being able to be used in a godly way that will help us improve and help us um, be able to meet those qualifications for which we aspire <clears throat> I want to share a little bit about the process of judgment. Now, God's final judgment is upon two categories of people, the willing and the unwilling. The willing are those that accept the fact that they are sinful. They, um, they accept the fact that, that the Bible is the standard by which they are judged, and they also accept the, the actions that Christ did when he died on their behalf on the cross. And so in partnering with and receiving his death, the consequence that they get at the end of their judgment is eternal life. Now, God's final judgment on the unwilling are those that reject sin. They sometimes even reject the reality that there is sin. And then, of course, with this, if they don't acknowledge the reality of sin, then they probably don't even acknowledge the, that the Bible is a standard by which they are going to be measured. And regardless of the fact of whether they acknowledge it or not, they're still going to be judged by that standard. 
and also they do not accept the role of Christ upon their lives. And unfortunately, but well deserved, their consequence of the judgment will be eternal destruction. Now, when man it operates in the role of judgment, and I would say more, more accurately when man operates in the role of both judgment and discernment, it is usually upon those that either are unwilling or unaware, and we'll, we'll get into that right now. Now, the unwilling is usually when man is operating in a role of judgment in the remove the speck kind of fashion that we talked about in Matthew, where they're, they're being operated by mo motivations that are not godly. And because of that, they're not dealing with their own situations. And the people that they are trying to remove the speck from their eye are, aren't willing. They're because they're being basically attacked. They're being, um, they're being criticized and, and it's being done by someone that is not acting in a godly capacity. Other times when man's judgment is, um, is passed, it could be upon those that are unaware. And this would be an example of this would be when the disciples were sent out by Jesus and Jesus says, look upon the town and if, they, if the people receive you, then basically go in and, and share with them. If they don't receive you, then just wipe the, the dust off of your sandals and go on your way. And in this case, the people that are being judged aren't even aware of the fact that they're, they're being judged. The real impact that, that they have is kind of indirect in that they don't get the benefit of, being, of receiving the ministry and the blessing that could, could have potentially come to them um, through the disciples from Christ. Now, when man's judgment falls under the category of evaluation, then it is upon those that are willing. Because both the judge and those that are judged are operating in harmony. And when the judge does so, he is right with God, he's free from sinful baggage, and the judge has presented, those that are being judged, have presented themselves um, before those in authority to judge them because they're aspiring to a role and usually they are open to correction. One of the marks of godly judgment is love. And, and the reason we know this is because the alternative to godly judgment would be apathy. If God didn't judge us, then he wouldn't love us. And he would simply leave us to, to the evil to rule us, and there would be no accountability, and we would be living in chaos. But God justly defines what is and what is not right. God loves us so much so that he even warns us of the impending judgment, as he does not desire that any of us sh should perish. You see, when we go to school, we, we receive teaching and we receive knowledge. However, if we went to school and none of us ever had a test, then we would not be accountable to the knowledge that we're gaining and we would have no way of even measuring whether or not we, had, we, we were accurately learning the things that were being taught to us. And God tells us of the impending judgment to come. And along the way, as we submit ourselves to him, we are, be, we are even saying, Lord, test me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is our way of almost receiving a judgment before the final judgment. And once again, we're going into it with a willing heart because we are aspiring to become better in our walk with Christ. And the fact that God even warns us of the impending judgment to come is his reflection of his love because his desire for us is that none would perish. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. When we judge another, it must be with God's love. The judge's heart should be for the benefit and the betterment 
of those that are judged. In Galatians 1, in, I'm sorry, in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, we read, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. You see, the process of judgment in this aspect, and I think it's more aptly called correction, only works when there is harmony between both the judge and the person being judged. In Matthew 18 verses 15 through 17 we read, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. You see, that is the end goal of correction, is that we would do so, um, and at the end of that process of correction, that that person would receive it, and then we would be even closer in our, um, in our relationship with them. Because one of the things about it, when a person comes to us and they corrects us, it's, it's difficult to receive that correction when, when we don't, when that person puts themselves above us and we feel like we're being talked down to. If we're the one receiving that correction, we immediately become defensive because we know that we're vulnerable, because we know that our weaknesses are being basically, um, they're being, they're being shown, you know, we're being laid open. We're, we're kind of barren. We're very vulnerable. And so that's why God is saying, you need to acknowledge the fact that that person is going to be very vulnerable. And don't just go in there with this, this haughty, proud attitude and say, you know what, you, you need to just, you need to stop doing that. And we need to go in and we need to bear the burden with them. We need to be willing to walk with them in that process, not simply just point it out and go, you know what, you need to clean up your act or we, if we're going in there to correct them, then we need to be willing to walk with them through that process. That's what true love is all about. And also in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, where he says, um, the one that's, that's providing the correction, he says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. The person that's correcting um, is not necessarily above correction because they're literally they're literally just as susceptible, just as vulnerable to sin as the person that they're correcting. Um, so he's saying, for example, if if you're gonna if you're going to go in and point out to somebody that hey maybe they have a drinking problem, maybe it's not the best place to to go into the bar and have six or seven beers with them and go, you know, um, I I think that you may have a problem with alcohol, you know, because. <laughs> You, you at that point are being tempted by the very things that you may be there to uh, help a brother out with. <laughs> and so um, we need to be sure that we watch uh, how we correct and do it, in a, do it in compassion and do it with love. And then the last thing that we're going to touch on is we need to avoid fruitless endeavors. Um, he tells us basically know your audience. In Matthew 7, 6, he says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot, and turn to attack you. You see, this verse actually came out of a, um, an action when people would go and they would try to feed these stray dogs. They would um, try to give the dogs food. Maybe they were trying to befriend the dog. And sometimes those dogs would turn even after they had been given the food and they would snarl and they would growl at them, showing that, you know, they were not about receiving any kindness and they were not about, you know, befriending the, the hand that fed them. And so we don't correct those that are not open to receiving it. So as, um, as we wrap things up today, I want to just kind of recap because I've talked about judgment in a lot of different um, aspects, but I think the one that's most, um, that's most current for us as believers is when we would provide correction for a brother and sister in the Lord. So here are the, um, the five steps to godly correction, if you'd, if you'd like to kind of take notes on this. The first one is check your own heart. Um, and really see, is, is your goal for this person that you are seeking to correct 
restoration and growth. If it's not, then you may actually find yourself falling in the category of trying to remove the speck from their eye when you're actually even blind because you have the log in your own eye. Number two is be discerning. See if this person is receptive. If they're not receptive, then do not proceed. But if you can check mark number one, that your heart is right, and number two, that they seem receptive and open, then, then proceed to number three, which is to prayerfully proceed with humility and gentleness. Don't just go charging in there like you know exactly this person's situation because you may not. Prayerfully um, inquire of God about the best approach that you should take before going in and speaking with this person. And do so acknowledging that even saying something about this um, person's struggle is an area of weakness and it may be very sensitive and they may, and they may be very vulnerable. And your goal is to maintain their openness and their receptivity and you need to do so by not stepping on their toes. You need to do so by extending love and gentleness and understanding and compassion. Number four, offer correction only. And that's very important. Don't go in there just commanding and providing instructions. Offer correction only. It's, it's very different when you offer someone because it, it, it maintains, because the reality of the situation is, is you don't have any ability to make a person do anything. But by offering, you're simply pointing out the options that they have. And you say, you know what? Um, here, here's something that maybe you could consider. Um, and in so doing, you're once again maintaining that person's receptivity and openness. And the minute you encounter resistance, just back off and then I'll table that conversation, um, love on that person, you know, be, be open to where they are. And at that time you may just say, well, let's just pray. It seems like this is maybe a good place to stop. Let's just pray. Proceed only when you are in partnership with that person because correction is all about maintaining the relationship that's end, whose end goal is restoration and growth. And the fifth one is correction is only for the believer. We do not correct an unbeliever unto salvation. And, and I think that's why so many unbelievers are a little bit wary of Christians is because they always think that Christians are going to be out there, you know, telling them, you're going to hell if you do this and you're going to hell if you do that. The word of God convicts people. And it's not to say that we shouldn't share the Word of God, but once again, if we are to share a correction with people in love, then that also applies to the unbeliever, but we're not to share correction with the unbeliever because they're not open to receiving it. We are to share love with the unbeliever because we love them where they are, we love them for who they are because we don't have the power or the ability to change either of those things. And it's because it's that very means that brought us into the kingdom. In Romans chapter 2 verse 4 it says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? You see, we were, re we were led um, to repentance because God loved us. He was patient with us. His kindness was overwhelming. And it's in that same fashion that we are a true disciple of God in sharing the word of God with the world is when we allow God's kindness to be the one, the, 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 basically the, that's the flag that we carry if we want to reach the lost for Christ. It is that kindness of God that will lead them to repentance. And that is only an act of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit can work through us, but in order for the Holy Spirit um, 
to, in order for a person to repent, the Holy Spirit has to work within them, and that is not something that we are capable of doing. So in conclusion, we need to reserve judgment for God. We need to be discerning before correcting another. And finally, we need to simply pray for the unsaved. Let's, let's go ahead and end in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the reality of your love for us. We thank you that you love us enough to judge us, to, to set a standard of right and wrong. And Lord, you give us the insight that judgment is coming. And Lord God, we don't have to wait for final judgment. We can seek you um, any day that we want, any hour that we want to say, Lord, test me right now. See where I fall under your um, your scruples. Help me to understand the areas where I can improve. And Lord, help us to aspire to continue to improve and to qualify for those for those roles that you have reserved for us. Lord, when we do correct another, allow it to be done with love and with partnership. And last of all, Father God, allow us to love the unsaved. Allow us to share your kindness with them so that they too might become a brother and a sister that we could um, continue to walk with as we see them restored and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God, we pray these things in your mighty name. Amen.